From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis, codenamed Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. If you're hearing this, the evening it publishes. Congratulations, folks. We've made it midway through July 2024, and we are joined with our favorite part of the show, you and your fellow listeners. We're going we're gonna to hear uh, about Nazi drugs. That's a real thing still. Uh, FedEx and the cops. Uh, we've got a great UAP story. Uh, a little bit more insurance. We've been going through an insurance rabbit hole. Uh, and some responses to our ideas about how best to create micro generation um before we do any of that we were talking off air about um about something that really really stood out to me and i think uh, a lot of us in the crowd tonight are going to identify with this i don't know about you guys but i anthropomorphize so many inanimate objects i am in like deep it's not quite parasocial but i'm in deep sustained relationships with weird things like the good fork and so on. <laughs> like the one that doesn't have the, the, the time that's somewhat bet where it's giving you the finger. Um, you guys, you ever seen those little hooks they use in bathrooms where you can hang up like your jacket or whatever? If you look at them, they kind of look like an octopus that's trying to box with you. That's sort of squinting an eye at you, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. true, dude. There's there, there are whole Instagram accounts. Uh, yeah, the, things the, that look the, like yeah. faces. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. also one called like Sinister Toilets, mm-hmm. which I really think is a lot of fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. So maybe for this, uh, as we get into tonight's program, uh, just think along, look around your environment while you're while you're hanging out with us this evening, folks, and uh, tell us, write to us, conspiracy.diehardradio.com, and tell us your favorite inanimate object that you have ascribed a personality to. We want to learn all about it, uh, especially if there's one that you anthropomorphize and don't care for. You know Ooh, what I mean? It's like a sinister toilet, perhaps. Yeah. The bad <laughs> fork. Yeah. All right. It's time to jump into listener mail. This one comes to us uh, via the side pocket kid, which I, I love. I don't exactly know what that means, uh, but I, I think it's cool. I mean, I guess it's sort of like, like a Western. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's right. The side pocket. Yeah. For some reason, I'm thinking of like, aren't all pockets on the side? But no, I'm c- certainly some are on the back and some are on the front. But traditional pants pockets, you know, do reside on the side. But this is most definitely a pool reference, a billiards reference. Or pants kind of just themselves a pocket for your legs two open ends yeah <laughs> yeah you could say sure. the same with i guess uh, yeah shirts. everything's a pocket if you really think about it do you ever anthropomorphize yeah. pockets uh, is that <laughs> Where's even... the good pocket <laughs> i know what the good pocket is yeah you do yeah, yeah well yeah. I like it's it. always I the like left it one when... oh, well it depends really i guess on I'm, what I'm side different. you're on or what hand you write with I think every living entity or every entity in general has its own like personal mythology of these little beliefs, like the idea that maybe the left hand is for taking energy, the right hand is for giving it stuff like that. Side pocket Wiping kid. the butt? <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Dude, have you ever been in a majority Muslim country and eaten with your left hand? Not a good look. People won't get mad at you, but they will assume that you are dirty. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, it, it was side pocket kid. Sorry, side pocket just kid. No, it's right. I do like it when things are uh, in the pocket, as they say, uh, which this email most definitely is. Uh, ben, you teased it beautifully. Uh, hey, guys, just listen to your most recent Strange News episode, and I really enjoyed the conversation about converting the heat from the AI GPUs uh, into usable power. I am an electrical technologist who works for a private utility company, and thinking of different methods to harness power into already built infrastructure is something that I love 
deserve to do. Personally, I would love to see microgeneration everywhere. Aside from the usual solar panels and wind turbines on roofs, uh, one pilot project caught my eye was run in Portland, Oregon. They tested installing micro water turbines, uh, turbines, turbines, whatever. I, I think they're interchangeable, roughly, uh, into the existing water main system. Uh, I found the article from GoodNet to be a decent read. Guys, I linked to that in the doc. If you want to take a quick look, it is, in fact, uh, quite a good read uh, coming to us from GoodNet, Gateway to Doing Good, written by Bonnie Riva Rass, the deputy editor there at GoodNet. Um, going on with the email, uh, thinking about all that rabbit hold me into thinking about the Venus Project, particularly about city design and how we should be developing cities and buildings that incorporate natural geographic features into the design process. I think the Venus Project would make an excellent episode, and I would love to hear you guys do a deep dive and hear your thoughts on it. Anyways, I love the show and all the work you guys put into it. Kept me company on many a car ride. Feel free to use this on air. If you guys find any value in it, you can call me Side Pocket Kid. Cheers and say weird. I love everything about this. This is one of those things where we, I think, Matt, it was you, where it was just like, this has to happen. This has to be a thing someone's thinking about. This is a perfect example of parallel thinking or just seeing a need where it just doesn't make sense for this kind of technology not to exist. Unfortunately, as we know, with many companies, their primary focus isn't necessarily helping the environment. It is more making money for their shareholders and, you know, making their bottom line. Um, and, and of course, then some above their bottom line, preferably. Uh, but this pilot program, we'll get to the Venus Project in a bit. That might be a bigger discussion for another day. Um, but this program in Portland, Oregon, is essentially just that. It, it, there is a field known as micro generation um, where you can essentially funnel pre-existing infrastructure, tap pre-existing infrastructure into uh, other forms of electrical generation. And we know hydroelectric power is already created by the movement of water. Um, and in the city of Portland, they installed a hydropower system that captures energy as water flows through its main pipelines. I'm very bullish on hydropower. It's as so I said cool. It's I mean, be because we know hydropower already exists. I mean, we all went to the Hoover Dam together and that was a thing to behold. And that's like the very definition of industrious uh, thinking behind hydroelectric power, uh, harnessing the, you know, the powers of, of nature or whatever. Um, why not build smaller generation sources like this into the water pipes of a city? So every time someone turns on the tap and causes the water to flow or change pressure or what have you, a little bit of electricity is generated and it either goes back into the grid or it's captured or, you know, stored or whatever. Um, so let's see. Unlike solar power, the article says, or wind, the system can generate electricity in any weather, anytime, since water is always flowing through them and there is absolutely no impact on water delivery or quality. Uh, here comes a quote from Greg Semier, or Semler, rather, CEO of Lucid Energy, the Portland-based startup that built the system. Um, and he was speaking to Fast Company, saying, it's pretty rare to find a new source of energy where there's no environmental impact. But this is inside a pipe, so no fish or endangered species are impacted. That's what's exciting. Lucid Energy um, designed and installed four uh, of these, uh, let's see, 42... I'm not sure what this jet with this uh, metric is here. It's it's a it's a way of measuring kilowatt strength. 40, yeah, 40, 40, 42 inch, 50 kilowatt. Yes. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. 42 inch, 50 kilowatt power generating turbine pipes into one of the city's main water lines. Um, the power that it generates is then sent right into the electrical grid. So it's it doesn't even need to be stored. It just adds capacity to the grid. And as we know, uh, with all of this AI stuff, the issue there becomes one of capacity, uh, where if we don't plan for this stuff, um, and as we know, you know, with the heat that's generated in a lot of places, the climate rather, um, brownouts, rolling power outages can be a thing. I believe Texas was a real offender in that department where there were just like tons of these rolling power outages due to heat there because they didn't uh, do any kind of future proofing to this infrastructure. So, you know, we know Portland is a pretty liberal and uh technologically forward thinking part of the country. So it kind of makes sense that a pilot program like this would be there. Um, it says here too, since water utilities use a huge amount of electricity, this type of system can make it cheaper to provide water 
for municipalities that can use the power themselves or sell it as a source of revenue. Um, I do think this is really, really interesting. I don't know how exactly we would be able to or, or folks would be able to accomplish this with harnessing the GPUs, but I don't see how Matt's idea of just adding an additional small turbine to these potentially hundreds of thousands of processors um, that are generating heat and causing them to spin couldn't generate some meaningful amount of energy. I don't know. Maybe maybe we go back to that uh, because it does seem like the question then becomes one of scale. And is it worth doing if it's not done on a large enough scale? But this mm-hmm. seems to be like one municipality, uh, one city, and it does seem to be a value. So uh, I don't know. I, I do think that there's some something to think about here. Let's just make the GPUs waterproof. Put them in the water mains. <laughs> we'll just line our water mains with GPUs that are all. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. No, no. no I, think, I think that's right. <laughs> like I like I said earlier, I think the hydropower is the way to go. You know, if the geography works out, similar to geothermal power in Iceland, there's some great, fascinating things. First off, side pocket kid, uh, SPK. If I could be familiar with you, uh, thank you so much. I've been on a little rabbit hole about exactly what an electrical technologist does, uh, and I find it amazing and important. Uh, So you must also, I'm sure, be well aware of the tidal power experiments that we mentioned briefly. Uh, I think out in Europe, there is tremendous opportunity here. Uh, The ideas are, uh, to to the point Noel made earlier, Side Pocket Kid, uh, the idea of micro generation and the threshold of scale is endlessly fascinating to me because it's decentralizing in a way. It's decentralizing some of the power grid. Like if we get a um, a toolkit of micro generators from all sorts of different energy sources, then we're also we're addressing some of the problems of centralized power sources. And we're addressing the uh, all your chickens and one or all your eggs in one kind of basket situation because then if for some reason one kind of power source is no longer as feasible or as viable, then we automatically have some backups baked in. Uh, it is an awesome idea. It'd be really cool to roll it out and SPK if you can uh, write to us again and and let us know after you hear this uh, or we'll follow up as well. Why do you think this has not been rolled out at a larger scale to to Noel's original question here? Because it really could be a game changer. And I think we're all on the same page with that. Well, when I Google like harnessing GPU for electric energy generation, the only articles I get are talking about, um, I guess, streamlining the way GPUs consume power. So it does not seem that this is something that is being discussed. And it may, and I, you know, if, if this individual who wrote to a side pocket kid, you know, has a background in this stuff, he didn't immediately say we were full of crap. Uh, I do think there might be something to that, you know, and the fact that no one's talking about this, it may just be that question of scale but we know that well here's the thing i guess what we're talking about is the fans that are in play here are being powered by electricity and designed to cool the gpus but we do know they also get really hot and i'm wondering if there's a way to funnel that heat into some other form of energy and if there's enough of them happening at the same time then it maybe could be meaningful or maybe it's just not nearly enough it's a drop in the bucket and we're totally barking up the wrong tree but it does seem like in the face of this increased demand that there ought to be some quid pro quo way of kind of giving back to the grid you know balancing yeah. the scales a little bit well, it's really tough because you, you got to first have the idea somehow, then know how to actually implement a prototype, then convince a bunch of investors somewhere either on a city level, a state level, a country level, a company level. Then you got to pay a lot of money to make it happen for the first time and then spread those costs out over you know years and years and years. So when you're thinking of when we're talking about the water main uh, hydroelectric generation you're talking about, Ben, with like the, this article we were looking at, I imagine the costs of actually going in and retrofitting pipes or adding in new pipes that would have this system Dude. in them. Would Especially be, with aging uh, pipes and infrastructures like we have here in Atlanta or in other parts of the country, like in Michigan. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, it's, no. it is a conundrum, you know. 
it would be tremendously expensive. You'd need an infrastructure bill or something, you know, where there's a bunch of money injected into a system. Uh, just shout out, I guess, to that. Um, but But this type of thing we're talking about, where you use an existing energy source that is just out there, that is happening all the time reliably, and maybe even power is used to generate that initial energy source, right? So I'm thinking about in that same place, goodnet.org, there's an article from 2018 about a young inventor who had the idea of setting up these plastic sheets along London's rail lines, which would then flutter in the wind as a train went by, which would generate electricity through the movement of those sheets. Like, how brilliant is that? And why wouldn't, why aren't we doing stuff like that all over the place where cars go by on a highway and there's an overpass? You set something up down there that just generates electricity. Even if it's small, it, if you do it enough times, that kind of thing adds up. Or material science with pavement. We studied this yeah. in car stuff as well, like going back to the generation of power from tides. It's already there. It's just there are ways to channel it. I would add one important piece of the puzzle that we haven't hit yet. Part of the reason, and Side Pocket Kid, tell me, uh, tell me how real this is or how overblown it is, but it, it seems to be one of the big stumbling blocks is the... Um, is the fact that there are embedded stakeholders who do quite well with uh, the imperfect status quo as it is at this point. So they're, they're the ones you have to not antagonize, but you have to pitch them and you have to convince them that this is uh, a long-term better, AKA more profitable concept. And I, I don't think it's a difficult argument to make. Uh, I just personally don't know enough about the, ins and outs of the the policy horse trading that has to occur to get your you know your Georgia powers or what have you is your con eds on board with something that in their opinion might not seem proven at scale you kind of have to be like the first guy who convinced someone to let them build a skyscraper you know what I mean they want to know it's not going to collapse I just want to say that I just found, you know, it's Reddit, so take it with a grain of salt. I don't know this person's credentials, but I'm seeing a few folks chiming in, and, and it doesn't seem this is the most out there uh, perspective on the planet. But this person, uh, Riftblade MC, on this Reddit thread is saying, uh, GPUs are almost as efficient as normal electrical heaters. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only converted. The GPU consumes electricity and converts it into a few types of power. It converts a small portion into sound, coil wine, which is a thing. It's a phenomenon on where you can actually have a, a electronic component that generates sound. It's actually not supposed to happen, but it, it can happen. Uh, it converts a small portion into kinetic energy, the fans on the GPU cooler, but almost all of it is converted into heat. GPUs are probably around 1% less efficient at converting electricity into heat than a normal electric heater. There are a few other types of heaters. Some heaters are gas heaters, which are less. However, I know that usually cheap gas is cheaper than electric for the same amount of heating, so gas is more cost-effective than GPUs. Then there are also heat pumps, which this can up in our previous conversation, which instead of generating heat from energy, they work by extracting heat from the air outside and putting that heat into the air in your room. This allows heat pumps to be the most energy efficient and cost effective. Uh, I, I think there's something to it, guys. I really do. <laughs> who, who do we talk to? <laughs> Call um, GE. Get, get them on the case. I mean, I, I, this is getting me kind of excited because it really does seem like it's a bit of an untapped thing. Uh, and people have been having these conversations. So I don't know. I say thank you kindly to uh, to uh, Side Pocket Kid for yeah. giving us this way in. And um, I want to I, I want to hear more about this. Could you even write back to us or maybe leave us a voicemail? Side Pocket at a one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Let us know if we're completely barking up the wrong uh, microchip when it comes to this idea of the heat that's generated by these. And could they be harnessed in a way that is positive? Let us know. We're going to take a quick break, hear a word from our sponsor, and come back with more messages from you. And we've returned. Jeff Arnold, we know you're still out there. Marshall Brain. Ben, I was thinking about conversations way back. Noel, I don't think you were here yet. Way back with Marshall Brain about car innovations, specifically in road innovation, with like vehicles that would be electric and they'd be powered as they drive, kind of like the way mm -hmm. some of the new technology with phones where you can just place a phone, you know, on a surface that will allow it to on charge. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this. 
yeah, yeah. exactly with the mag with exactly with the uh i don't know however it works science uh that stuff gets me so excited uh these are electric materials, what they're called. Yeah. There uh, we go. I was super into it um, a long time ago. So SPK, yeah, please let us know why it's not happening at a larger scale. Yeah. I think we all got excited about it back in the day when it was like a thing and it was like a new thing. You're like, whoa, that's going to be amazing. Uh, well, hey, you know what else people were into back in the day? Uh, sitting out by the pool back in 2015, just like. Berker Berserker was. So we're going to hear a message <laughs> right now about that. Irma Gerd, Berker Berserker. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Hey, Matt, Ben, Noel, and Super Producers. My name is Berker the Berserker, and I have a UFO or a UAP black triangle sighting to get off my chest. Back in 2015, when I was around 17 or 18, I was at my neighborhood pool in Oceanside, California. By the way, the name of the neighborhood is Vista Capri, if you want to look it up on Google Maps. And I was laying down after a mile swim with my legs in the hot tub and staring at the sky. Now, this is important. I was laying down with my head pointing south-southeast, and my legs were pointing north-northeast. And then while I was laying there, you know, it was probably 9 or 10 at night, I saw something like a giant black check mark with seven red, almost infrared lights underneath it. You know, it may have been eight because there was that one there was one light in the very point as well so there were three red infrared lights glowing on the left side and there were four on the right side and you know one in the middle and it was just so creepy uh it made no noise at all it was around 20 or 30 feet in length and it moved incredibly slowly like incredibly slowly it must have been five or ten miles an hour and it was roughly 40 to 50 feet above me. And it passed directly overhead. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't wearing anything but my boxer shorts or my, uh, my swim trunks at the time. So, and it went directly northwest to southeast, directly over me. And um, I thought that I was being scanned. It looked like I was scanned. <laughs> at first, I thought it was a drone. But at the height it was, I would have definitely heard the whirring, and it made no noise. It was absolutely silent. I, I really couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't tell anybody about it that night, but the next day I looked it up, and I read on black triangles, and it was so eerie, but so, so cool. Anyways, I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. By the way, I've always enjoyed your show. I'm a longtime listener, and you've always given me virtual comfort when I was driving home alone through the desert for work and keep up the great content. Keep spreading the truth. I appreciate you all. This is Berker the Berserker signing off. Thanks so much, dude. Wow. What a cool story. Yes. Thank you, Berker. I, I really appreciate that. And I find the comment about the asymmetry or perceived asymmetry of the vehicle quite intriguing. Right. Was one led just out? Maybe. No, uh, the way Burger Berserker describes this craft as a check mark, which is really interesting. And it does make you wonder if it's just perception because there was maybe one LED that was not working or one light. Who knows what the light source was? Or was it actually, you know, differently shaped like that? Because that really does change my thoughts on what this thing could have potentially been. Do you have a uh, running guess? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, I was thinking just because of where that part is, did you guys look up Oceanside, California? Oceanside, California is, well, I mean, it's right on the coast, so it's not like interior California. Um, it is, I don't know, let's say it's in between San Diego and Los Angeles, closer to San Diego, much closer, actually. Right down the way from Carlsbad, right? It's yes, exactly. People. Exactly. Um, and, you know, this this Pacific coast over here, there's a lot of activity from the U.S. military, from the Navy. But most of it will you guys tell me I'm aware of most of that activity happening closer up to San Francisco um, and then closer, maybe down towards San Diego. But I, I don't know, maybe something passing by or through there. It's interesting how specific Berserker is about the direction, right? Northeast, uh, legs pointing northeast, head pointing south, southeast. Um, 
And then the way this thing traveled from northwest to southeast. Because if we're talking from this location northwest, that's along the coast pretty much, like heading up the United States. Um, and then heading southeast, that's heading down towards Mexico. I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? I just really like the story. <laughs> One of the first things to do here, or what I would do if writing an episode on this, would be, uh, obviously, Matt, you've probably already done this, uh, you have as well, I imagine, Berger, uh, look up the closest Air Force bases or closest compounds for experimental craft. That's one. Um, you know, you build out the references. The, we the weird thing is, increasingly, I was a little more skeptical on this back in earlier evenings, but the weird thing is there, there are provably strange things in the sky. There are real UAP uh, or what we would call UFOs. Uh, the, this doesn't mean they're necessarily aliens. It doesn't mean they're necessarily all top secret, you know, skunk works projects, but there's definitely stuff out there. One thing that we are always careful to do, it's a core tenant of our mission is not to dismiss a sighting out of hand because that's incredibly unhelpful. Matt, did you get a chance to uh, speak with Berker directly for any guesses on his part? No, I did not. But well, along those same lines, my guesses were Camp Pendleton, which mm -hmm. is a pretty big name, something we've heard before on this show. Uh, even if you're not, you know, uh, close to military or have been in the military before, Camp Pendleton is a big deal. It is just, I guess it would be uh, northwest of this area, uh, actually the, just northwest of this specific Vista Capri neighborhood in Oceanside, California, which, you know, there's a Marine air support squadron hanging out right over there. Big old, you know, airport that's for military use only. There's also a Raising Canes, by the way, on that, <laughs> on Camp Pendleton. <laughs> I'm just looking the at that right place. now. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that place was so like revered <laughs> and sought after. <laughs> People yeah. who like it, like it, man. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> there's a large Department of Homeland Security building that is right on the coast. Uh, basically, if you headed straight to the coast from the house where Berserker was. I don't know. The shape, you guys, I want to know more about that shape. Call in. Have you? Has anybody heard of a checkmark shaped craft like that? Because it makes me think about some of the symbolism that companies use, you know, we talk about the, we, or we have talked about before on the show, the shape of the NASA on their logo. There's that little wisp kind of thing that's on there and what that actually represented, what this, the Nike thing actually may have been a couple other things like that about shapes of craft and shapes of, you know, or potential craft, right? There's cool stuff out there. What's the check mark? Right to us, especially if you were piloting the check mark. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. From the CLB 13th Armory. I don't know why they would be flying something like that, though. Classic CLB. <laughs> All right. So, hey, let's jump to another quick message here. This time from no one in particular. Guys, I didn't know this, and I've always put it in our voicemail system as N-O space O-N-E in particular. We got an email from this person, and it is no one, like N-O-W-A-N. Mm -hmm. No one, no one in particular. Like and Rowan, but no one. Exactly, exactly like Rowan, but no one. And this person that we have uh, come to know and love had a quick comment on something we were talking about, about the speed of life when we were just kind of briefly mentioning that. Noel, I think you brought that up. Uh, so here is no one's message. Hello, this is no one in particular. And as usual, you are welcome to use this. Noel mentioned a... Uh, apparent fluctuation in the passage of time between being young and being old. And it's far more than apparent, I'm sure you're about to mention, but I'd like to give you my little take on it, which is that when you're five, one year is 20% of your life. Whereas now that I'm 50, it's only 2% and seems to fly by. Just something I thought about one day. You guys have a great show. Bye. Man, I love that. It makes me think of like the idea of dog years, you know, the idea of like what is the typical span of a life and how does that compress and contract to a 
being that inherently does not live as long as a human being? And, and I think the answer is simple. It's, 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 it's hugely important. We just as humans are able to perceive it much more palpably than obviously a dog or a cat, you know, or, 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 or the well, lizards live a really long time, like alligators. But um, I do think that matters. And like, like how much of your life have you lived? And as you live longer, that percentage changes, doesn't it? I, I, that's, I think that's, uh, I can't believe I've never quite thought about it like that before. It's well put, I think. Uh, yes. It's just, yes. Uh, that's what I really appreciate uh, about it. And it, it makes you think about things differently. I was, just, I was thinking about my son's life and just, you know, he was talking about how the summers are feeling shorter, right? And he's only eight. <laughs> he's like, oh, man. Sorry, bud. Oh, bro. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. <laughs> That's such a sad thing. That is so poetically melancholy. You know, oh, the summer is a seeming show to fall. <laughs> well, just basically yeah. commenting how it feels like it's going by fast. But it's Absolutely. in the end, for his perception, it's actually good because he's done a lot this summer, right? Uh, back in the day, summers were a lot uh, less filled with going places and doing things and traveling. Mm-hmm. And I think it means, hopefully, that his life is more full than it was before. At least that's the way I often think about it when I think about how quick stuff goes think about guys what do you ever get that feeling when you look at our listener mail strange news doc just about how many episodes of this particular thing we have done and it to me the perception is that we just started making these episodes (laughs) i still can't believe that when i was doing the daily strange news i can't believe how many like that was years ago now right Actually, yeah, you did. Ben pandemic. did start this. Uh, or, well, this whole set of segments as a as a, its own show. We I saw something that compiled the number of total stuff they don't want you to know episodes or segments that we have, and it's crazy because, folks, in full transparency, I think one time we tried to count them, and we could. I, I don't remember if we could figure it out. Did we ever nail down and write the correct thing? I, I can't remember. I, I don't know. The number is, I think, less. Uh, impressive to me. I mean, it is, it's, it's obviously an artifact of this uh, phenomenon that we're describing, but it's like every time I see uh, it's, it's the 10 year anniversary of X record that was like a big deal to me or whatever. And I'm like, no, no, that's the new one. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. that's the new arcade fire record. You know, like, oh my God. And you start to think too about things like 1990 is as far away from now as like 1920 was from 19, you know, 60 or whatever. I mean, yeah, I'm bad at math, but you see what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's all about where you stand and your perception of time. Uh, and it does change as you get older, uh, but not always for the worse, I would argue. I don't necessarily feel like my life is slipping away. I feel like in a lot of ways I'm able to enjoy it a little more um, and really, you know, kind of lean in and sort of make a meal of it. I don't know why. Um, I don't always feel like it's a negative thing. It just is a a phenomenon that I find uh, very remarkable. And I also in particular love the percentage observation there. I think that is quite well put and quite astute. Uh, We're a big fan of yours over on this show. Uh, Also want to point out that um, I was reading this fascinating study on the nature of regret as people age, right? When you, when you get counted as elderly in a different population or culture and people don't regret things as often as we might assume, like when you're a younger person and you you think, oh, this is the worst. This is the worst thing. You know, I got a, I got an F on a test or I didn't get the, you know, I didn't get my uh, jury duty audition or whatever. And I think it's really important to remember that these things that can seem very big in the moment, often when people look back, uh, they don't feel that they were led wrong or they don't feel that it was a mistake. So without, at the risk of sounding so boxy and or trite, uh, it's very important to remember that because you have a problem with one tree, it doesn't mean the entire forest is bad. And sometimes the only way out of a situation is through that situation. So we've got your back. Don't break laws. We're required to say don't break laws. But um, I, I think it's just important to hear that sometimes, that even when things seem at their most dire and their most dark, uh, there's always something worth sticking around for. That's right. Get a bad tree, chop that down. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't know. Don't do that. Don't hurt the trees. We need the trees. 
Uh, all right. Well, thanks so much. And hey, if you've got something to say, you want to call us, we'll tell you how to do that at the end of this episode. Thanks so much to everybody else. Uh, A-Frame, we got one for you in the docket for this episode, but we're going to get to it at a different time. I'll just quickly mention it here. He came to us with some real world experience about why in certain insurance companies are moving out of certain areas. So I think maybe we can use that for a further exploration of the, of uh, on that subject. But it was it was not what you would think. He lives in an area where wildfires have traditionally been the problem. But it's not the wildfires that are making it untenable for, or at least the perception of being untenable to have insurance in certain areas for these insurance companies. It's some compounded other problem that's added on to what they usually already are paying, you know, paying out for wildfires in an area that's susceptible to those is when there's now flooding in that area too. And they're like, nah, we got to get out of here. (laughs) Or in his case, I think it was hailstorms or something. It was something crazy. Like what? All right. That's it for now. We'll be right back with more messages from you. And we have returned with a couple of things that was squirreling away from a conversation with a good friend of the show, Rebel, on Instagram. I almost didn't want to bring these up. Some of these are not news, so I might hold them for a different show that we do. Uh, But uh, (laughs) Rebel wrote to us recently with something that absolutely blew my mind. Nazi drugs are sweeping Europe. Nazi drugs? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get into it um, before before we get to our. You next mean ones. speed? What so, are we talking about? Even here? weirder. Okay. Uh, MDMA, which you don't usually associate with the militant far right of neo Nazis, but this has been happening for a number of years. Apparently, at the end of 2023, we'll go to Vice for this uh, excellent article by Simon Doherty. Um, At the end of 2023, police in the Netherlands pulled over a guy in a car who ignored a stop sign. Uh, He was not an autonomous driver. He was driving. Uh, And the cops quickly noticed three things. One, his license is not valid. No good. Two, he's clearly high on something. And three, in the passenger seat, in the shotgun seat right next to him is this huge bag like a trash bag of ecstasy pills that are all stamped with Nazi branding, with Nazi insignia. It's the (laughs) eagle symbol from the actual facts Nazis, as our pal Lauren Vogelbaum would say. Those were really popular in 90s rave culture. Man, you had the Mitsubishis, the Pokemon, and the the Nazi eagles. Those were the Mm -hmm. real banger. Uh, What do they call them? Rolls? Called it rolling (laughs) back then? Right, right, right. And so this, uh, the symbol, you can find this article easily. The symbol was, as we know, developed by uh, the Nazi party in the 20s, sometimes called the Imperial Eagle. They also found, in addition to these Nazi tablets, the cops found half a kilogram of weed or cannabis and 100 grams of cocaine. I don't know enough about cocaine to know if 100 grams is a lot, but it sounds like a lot. Is it a lot? It's a, lot. it's a lot. Yeah. Is it's that like, like a, what's a kilo? A kilo is I'm, I'm bad at weights and measures in addition to math, like I mentioned earlier, but a kilo tends to be the standard brick of, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 what you would be a unit of the largest quantity. You have like a giant, you know, quantity of kilos, uh, in a, a smuggling operation, a plane or what have you, but a kilo would be the smallest unit of that. If you're moving weight, right? Yeah, a yeah, kilo yeah. is 2.2 pounds. Uh, So if this is half a kilo, that'd be like a little over a pound. Still, that's a lot of, that's a lot of weed, you know, for your afternoon drive. It seems like he was probably going somewhere instead of just taking a fun road trip to get out in the open road. Uh, It's strange because furthermore, what we found here and Revel, thank you again for hipping us to this. uh, This was not an isolated incident. It appears that there are, there is a trend of illegal drugs going out through Europe stamped with Nazi insignia. And just to me, it's so confusing because, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm kind of square though, in full, in full honesty. Like, I don't know what the effects of ecstasy are like experientially or MDMA, but I always pictured it as sort of a more lovey dovey thing. Well, that's funny you should say that, Ben. I just, this, this immediately made me think of a song by a kind of jam band, 
super group called Oyster Head, which was uh, Les Claypool from Primus on mm-hmm. the bass, um, Trey Anastasio from Fish on the guitar, and Stuart Copeland from The Police on the drums. And I think they maybe had two albums, but on their first album, they have a song called Armies on Ecstasy. And the lyric is, the Army's on ecstasy, so they say, I read all about it in USA Today. They stepped up urine testing to make it go away, because it's hard to kill the enemy on old MDMA. Because, mm-hmm. yes, to your point, Ben, it, it does give you the love vibes. It's a real love fest. That's the whole point of MDMA. It's not conducive to berserker type uh, behavior. Yeah, sorry, Berker. But the uh, this is, yeah, okay, so I'm glad to know that perception of from the outside looking in is correct. Uh, the folks at Vice stumble on what may well be a conspiracy regarding this. The idea, we know that there's kind of a, what the Boffins would call a far right surge in, in Europe, like the political theater there. Uh, we also know that France got really close to having a fascist government just like last Recently. week. <laughs> the yeah. other day. Yeah. yeah Paul. <laughs> And so, excuse the voice. Who there, cried, but, by the way, apparently, when she lost, uh, which the internet is making hay with, you know, which I'm I'm fully behind. But, you know, it's, it's a big deal to everybody who runs for any kind of political office, to be fair. Uh, but here's the possible conspiracy. What if this far right surge is being um, sort of buoyed up by <laughs> being associated with fun drugs? What if this is like an underground PR propaganda campaign? for lack of a better word. Uh, do we think that's possible? I'm honestly asking because I think it could be a brilliant move for politicians in the U.S. I don't think I quite follow. To what end exactly? Like propaganda in whose favor? To get people to support uh, far right or Nazi like ideology by being associated with, with something fun, <laughs> good like, feels, very yeah. hey, fellow good, kids. good vibes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I yeah. follow you. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, uh, in the parlance of you know the the hippies, um, popping beans and burning crosses. That's <laughs> what we go. do here. Oh, buddy. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's Clarence cool. Thomas can't be all bad look at how much weed he gave me earlier <laughs> but it was total dirt weed though it had stems in it and seeds and everything mm-hmm. and he just got mm-hmm. it from some yeah. guy as a gift yeah next time we're just texting alito but the He's got bales <laughs> of the stuff the bales of it so it appears that this trend has extended to the supply of cocaine as well in 2023 uh some folks at a port in northern peru uh caught some smugglers and these guys have 58 kilograms of cocaine destined for Belgium. And to your point about transportation, each individual kilo was wrapped in Nazi regalia, which is not the most subtle way to sneak stuff through international borders. Please don't, Look at my Nazi bricks. <laughs> yes, with, with other insignia stamped into the, the powder. Um, that doesn't seem very smart or very likely. But again, at the time, though, they sort of had carte blanche to do whatever they wanted. Maybe they were just like, really just didn't give it F, you know? Yeah. Maybe there's some internal logic. Like, you know, the Nazis all- would have loved cocaine. I mean, I'm just saying like that. Uh, we, I, we know about too. them yeah. taking amphetamines. We don't Ooh. really hear much about cocaine per se, but amphetamines was just the order of the day. I mean, everyone was taking that stuff, you know, uh, the, the pilots, Hitler loved it. Apparently it was, it was like, uh, it was like one of his main things. Mm-hmm. It was not his main thing, but it was one of his things. That's right. <laughs> but uh, we also, he know, had another main thing that was, yeah, little, he had yeah. another main thing. Uh, there's, we also know uh, that authorities are still trying to suss out this international conspiracy because they're not sure whether, the, this kind of branding was ordered by neo-Nazi gangs who are selling drugs or whether it's unaffiliated drug gangs that have neo-Nazis as their prime demographic of customer. They really don't know. Uh, but we do know this seems to be a continuing trend. So I want to thank Vice again. Thank you, Rebel, because uh, we didn't see a lot of news about this. Or I don't know. Did, had you guys heard about this beforehand? Not once. Yeah. I'm glad that we haven't because, you know, I think it speaks to our character that we're not plugged into the world of neo-Nazi cocaine. You know what I mean? None maybe of us we like, should ah, that be. old chestnut. Yeah. <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe we need to plug in. <laughs> uh, this is interesting. Like, I would love to hear people's thoughts on this conspiracy, dot com, just because it gives us 
I think it's a door into something else, into a larger trend, you know, and we know that a lot of groups have not considered themselves drug cartels per se, but they get involved in the drug business because it is such a reliable form of income, right? Like aren't like biker gangs, are they still big with drugs here in the U.S.? Yeah, I, man. I, I, I think so. Uh, if, if what is it? Sons of Anarchy has anything to say. Oh, about that's it. right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we we do want to hear from you in this regard, folks, because uh, it sounds like there's something bigger at play. Uh, want to dig into this. And it's not. Yeah, I, I think this one got some headlines just because it seems counterintuitive for Nazis to be super into, you know, ecstasy or as you said no uh those kind of lovey-dovey feel-good drugs but it also mm, i don't know i think it could touch uh, other ideologies i'm interested in learning the mechanism also shout out to uh you rebel one last time before we close for hipping me to that story about scientists dosing octopuses with mdma oh that's a good idea that's just a really good idea just fafo <laughs> <laughs> before we get out of this i just really quickly ben you probed something in my mind with the uh, motorcycle gangs. Did you guys remember seeing that story a couple of weeks back about the Bakersfield Hells Angels? How the no, entirety I... of the motorcycle club in Bakersfield got arrested, uh, but not oh. for selling drugs. It was for assault, kidnapping, robbery, and a bunch of other things. But oh. but every single member got picked up. <laughs> Do we know how many people were talking? It was like the oh, whole chapter. Oh, gosh. It wasn't even that many. I think it was small. It was like seven human beings, but it was the entire Bakersfield Hell's Army crew. <laughs> that's crazy. They might have got wow. rico That's nuts. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that's how you scoop up a bunch of them, right? Isn't that sort of the deal? Yeah. Yeah. It, it also reminds me, um, I didn't talk about this on air, but we were talking about road trips. Uh, stay in my head pretty often. It's a good pursuit. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I like to take the back roads whenever possible. That's where you get to see more of the real world. Uh, and I remember quite recently, I had to go to the coast of the Atlantic Ocean and I took back roads on the return leg and I ran into so many sketchy looking motorcycle clubs and we got a lot of bikers in the audience tonight. We're glad you're here. Uh, we know that a, that a very small amount of biker Gangs are actually what we would consider criminal organizations, the so-called one percenters, what have you. But I would love to hear from someone on the inside who's had experience with this, like former outlaw bikers, former Hell's Angels, and so on. Do you think do you think we have a good chance of getting someone there? Or should we just stick with the uh doped up octopus and mm. interview one of those? Doped up octopus. It reminds me back at the beginning of the episode where you're talking about the anthropomorphic uh, items and you got the little creepy hook guy yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. in the bathroom trying to get into fisticuffs with you. I'm doing this thing with my fists right now, like the fighting Irish. It looks good. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think we need to get in with the Freemasons RC. Yeah, all right. They're the uh, Masonic Writing Club. We need we need to get in with those guys. <laughs> creative writing, <laughs> creative, creative Masonic writing. Yeah. They're separate yeah. from the Shriners, right? Oh no, mm, I think so. Because you know I they have so. the little cars. I wanted yep. the Iowa one and one of those sick little cars. So guys, bad parades. I have to say, I had a dream the other night that all three of us were in an improv show together, and I woke up and was just immediately like, "We got to take improv class." And I know you've mentioned that a million times, Ben, but I'm just doubling down on that. I think it would be super fun because in my dream, we were really good at it, and you know, it's kind of what we do here to a degree. So we we ought to we ought to try that sometime. Yeah, Heck I think yeah. everybody should have a little fun with improv. Yeah, it's just Dude. it's just. Good to do. No matter what your job is, it'll help you be a better communicator and, more importantly, a better listener, which is what I really had to work on. All of us prof. need to work on that for sure. But I'm going to keep going and talking instead of listening and telling you guys that the Iron Knights Masonic Riders are in Grovetown, Georgia. We need to, we need to go Let's check go. them out. <laughs> That's right Let's near go. my neck of where I grew up in a good yeah, Augusta. Man. That's right, like in my neck of the woods. I know Grovetown very well. Didn't know want, anything about that being the case, though, I have to say. Yeah. Well, the thing is, just show up and act like we belong there. There you, you go. You know what I mean? Just uh, the old rules. knuckles. <laughs> and we'll yeah. Yeah. Interview mode. Yes, as well. and them yeah. into loving us. And exactly. Being. 
there's something else we would need to look for, uh, look out for if we're on the road to Grovetown. And this is our, our last thing tonight. Instead of a letter from home, uh, our longtime friend of the show, Brock, aka the Brock Nest Monster, has written and hipped us to something frightening. This has been kind of an on the road week for us, and in, in that we're talking about a lot of automotive conspiracies. I did not know this until Brock told us, but uh, FedEx has their own police force. And they've had it for 20 years. Wait, for like investigating or for guarding and protecting? Guarding, protecting. Yeah, there's a, a that kind of stuff. There's an excellent Forbes article by Thomas Brewster that came out uh, that uh, hipped us to this. Forbes recently learned that FedEx is using some AI tools by a company called Flock Safety, a $4 billion startup for car surveillance, and it's monitoring its cargo and distro facilities across the U.S. It's also providing the information it gets to law enforcement, which is not un- inherently unusual. You know, a lot of companies, a lot of private companies do that even without being you know forced to do so. They volunteer it. But it appears that local police departments are also giving their own surveillance and flock feeds back to FedEx. It's a two-way street. They're building a public-private surveillance apparatus. Oh, Jeez, man. That doesn't sound very good. Match it up with all the Nest cams or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Woo! Did we talk about did we talk about those uh nest cams that like will shoot paintballs at people? The what? startup company. Yeah, it was like I maybe I maybe mentioned it just like in conversation or not on the show, but there was like a some like GoFundMe for a uh a home ring cam type situation that will threaten you with like an automated voice saying intruder, identify yourself or whatever. And if not, then it will sh- pelt you with paintballs. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean it's a it's really Without sounding hyperbolic, it's a brave new world. Uh, we're not ready. Civilization's not ready for the technology that's rolling out at scale. Folks like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, in the case of FedEx and uh, Flock Network, they are very concerned that this could go wrong quickly because, simply put, private entities are not subject to the same transparency laws that police are, in theory, subject to. So this could extend a silent, unseen mass surveillance network, and it might be legal for the public to be left in the dark about it. Oh, boy. Flock apparently specializes in license plate reading, too. So just quick fix, everybody. Make sure your license plate isn't facing the street. (laughs) <laughs> there we go. Yeah, especially if you live in a state like ours where you don't have to have the license plate on both si- ends of the car. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, we could also see a world in where this information is leveraged and collated with information that leads to targeted pricing. Shout out to Geist. You know what I mean? What, what if they have, they, I don't want to sound too paranoid, but what if these different types of apparatus can be combined into an Uber uh, panopticon, right? An Uber state that always has its eyes on you, never blinks, and can never be identified or held to account. That's the question. Let us know if that's crazy talk, if that's a whole bunch of, you know, sound and fury signifying nothing, or if there's some sand to it. We want to hear from you. Thanks to Burke or no one in particular, the side pocket kid, SPK to those in the know. Thanks to Rebel and shout out to the people we haven't gotten back to yet. Uh, very excited for uh, Radical Moderate and as you said, A-Frame and several other folks. We want you to join up with us. Thanks for tuning in and holler back. We try to be easy to find online. Yeah, we ain't no holler back, girl, but holler back at us indeed. Um, that was a really dated reference, but it is what it is. We're old. Time is weird. It compresses and contracts uh, percentages, all of that stuff. You can find us online where we exist at the handle conspiracy stuff on YouTube with video content coming at you on the regular on X FKA Twitter and on Facebook with our Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy on Instagram and TikTok. We're conspiracy stuff show. Hey, do you want to call us? Why not call one eight three three? S-T-D-W-Y-T-K. Put the number in your phone, save it with a contact and a picture of whatever creepy thing you find around you. I don't know. Close up of an ant. Put that in there. That's us now. (laughs) Sorry, guys. I don't know why I'm doing this. Um, uh, 
Once you've got that contact in there and you've chosen to call us, it may call you back. That's why we're asking you to do that. When you call in, give yourself a cool nickname. It can be anything. You've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. Do include whether or not we can use your name and message on the air. And if you've got more than you can fit into a three-minute voicemail message, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are. The entities who read every single piece of correspondence we receive. Forgot to add the most important question here. I think we started with this. Tell us about the inanimate objects that you have personified or anthropomorphized. Uh, tell us about the good fork, the bad spoon. Uh, tell us, <laughs> you know, the pants that you do or don't trust. Uh, our pants themselves, just pockets. Uh, reveal to us your wisdom on all these questions and more. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.